This is the 4.30 session with Robert Niesenbaum. He's going to be teaching us about connecting the dots, the relationship between WordPress, SEO, and social media. Robert has been a small business owner for more than 20 years. He has been using social media to build brand awareness, drive web traffic, and grow revenue for himself and clients since 2007. He has been speaking on and teaching social media marketing since 2010. His system, based on human behavior, relationships, networking, and his experience cold calling, can be successfully duplicated for any brand. When not online, he can be found on the water kayaking with the Puget Sound. So please give him a big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> and call some attention. Big round of applause. Love it. I know this material is for you. I want to make sure you guys leave here with something actionable, not just what I want to tell you. So if you have questions, we will make Dustin run around with the microphone and um, Devin run around with the microphone and give him some uh, exercise that he hasn't had enough steps yet today. So part of my background, I have been using social media since 2007. So before Facebook had pages, I was using it actually to grow my brands. Um, and I started blogging shortly after that. Very little of no, any knowledge on what search engine optimization was. No experience in content marketing, and obviously nothing specific about social media marketing. It really wasn't anything at that time. What I found over time, after getting a phone call from the hosting provider I was using, who also built my website back in 1998, was asking me what the hell was going on. That, no idea what he's talking about. It's like, the search traffic heading and the number of hits on my website just kept jumping. It was beyond what they were used to see. And no idea why this is happening. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew it was. And I found that over time, because I was actually posting content for my blog based on just simple FAQs, things that people would normally just ask me on an everyday basis that I was actually just answering in general. And rather than having to tell everybody every single time, I could publish these items. There was a reference point. I would share these out on social media. I was interacting with other people on social media. I was seeing results. Couldn't really connect everything as to why it was working. I just knew it was. To make sure that this really was not just an outside phenomenon where I set up my business I have now, Tactical Social Media, in 2015, I figured out how to use WordPress well enough to build a really crappy website. It's technically correct. The site will be updated. It's still crappy in their pages that don't load properly. What I was after is showing that I could use social media to drive search ranking based on what I've been doing, ignoring every traditional SEO rule and book. I have never done to this day keyword research of any shape or form. Okay? I don't pay much attention other than making sure as much as possible and Yoast is green. <laughs> but that's about the limit to what I did. I simply wrote and published naturally. The only piece I had going for me at the time was that I had been a published writer for you know, since high school. And all this kind of clicked about two years ago. So after this business has been running for a while, I was asked to explain search engine optimization. I've been talking about it, I've been writing about it, so now I've got to figure this out. And it kind of dawned on me that everything I'd been doing online all this time was what came natural to me, cold calling, networking. I never promoted myself. I still to this day don't carry business cards and networking events. If I, and when I do, I only hand them out if I'm specifically asked for it. The thought came up that what if Google was actually trying to behave online through their search algorithms the way we do every day with the people we talk to? That if somebody were to ask you for a recommendation, how do you behave? If I'm asked by a friend for a recommendation of who can I, he can hire to fix his roof, and I know over the past two years of talking to him that he's fixed this roof several times, he keeps complaining about leaks that have already been fixed, new leaks that are showing up, he's talked about replacing the roof over time. 
This gives me a good idea that it's probably looking at this point how to replace it, find something to replace the roof, not repair it. That is effectively Google taking our search history and how we behaved online and the way we had phrased our question and forming the intent of what we're asking for in that query. And then I've got to take all that piece and figure out who I'm going to recommend that I know that does roof. And the first thing I'm going to think about is who is capable of doing that job. Who has the expertise and the authority to actually get the work done the right way? Because obviously we're not going to refer anybody that's incapable of doing the job we think the person needs. The second thing that has to come to mind is professionalism. Will they return phone calls? Can they get it done on time? Can it be on budget? Will they return phone calls when necessary? If something goes wrong afterwards, are they going to be around? We are very low in human behavior to recommend somebody that is not going to be responsible or reliable, no matter how good they are. And there are a few exceptions to that rule as you have enough credibility behind you. Some of that professionalism can drop off, but in large, this is what we use. When I first did this presentation, I also included locale, but now Google has that automatically at this point. And enough of the clients and businesses that I talk to, my friends, they will drive from Portland to Seattle to do a job if the pay is right and the customer is right. So location has a little bit less importance depending on your brand, especially if we're WordPress developers or doing graphic design. We really don't have a geographic um, constraint at this point. And then I was wondering about how Google does this. And I started looking into Google search. And I came across an article that was published in Search Engine Journal, February 2nd, 2017. So we're about a year, two years out of date at this point. But based on everything I'm still reading, this is fairly relevant and pretty much on point now. And what I found in that article, the top four ranking factors Google uses are content, backlinks, mobile responsiveness, and technical factors. At this point, the way we've shifted in terms of when I first did this presentation, mobile responsiveness now falls into technical factors, things like AMP, and the fact that Google is actually using mobile speed as a direct ranking factor. And the interesting thing is if you do pull up a list of those somewhat 200 ranking factors that are in that algorithm, they all point back to these. It really just boils down to this. And to get this right, uh, a Google search quality senior strategist in March of 2016 basically stated that if you want to rank, you need content and backlinks. That was their deep deeper order down to. Okay. If you look at it, content's your expertise, backlinks are your authority, mobile responsiveness, tested, mobile responsiveness technical factors are your professionalism. We're all following along still? Every day of the week. Playing with the last two. This comes down to your website. That if you want to rank, it starts at the website level. This is talking about things like your slugs, your permalink structures, robots.txt files, sitemaps. This is all about page speed. These are all the things on the back end of the site. And the core of SEO starts when that website is built. So A, if you're a developer, make sure this stuff is priority, number one. Because again, how pretty a site looks doesn't matter in terms of whether it's going to rank or not. If this is in here, and if it's pretty and doesn't rank, it doesn't matter how much a customer does like it or not. And in the end, I will take functional over pretty. And to that end, my crappy website just landed a global claim. It still works. If you're looking to have a website built, find a developer that actually is doing this. And there are a couple tools out there that you can play with that I don't actually have listed here. For site speed and testing, I use gtmetrics.com. I know uh, the Pressable that's got partnered up with another firm here that's actually doing site speed tests. Uh, and it's actually pretty much on par with what I'm finding in gtmetrics. The other one I look for are things like accessibility issues, um, how things will appear on mobile and are rendered and touch taps, etc. Varvi.com, I don't know at this point how up to date it is, it's V A R V Y.com. 
And it would point even uh, validity errors and HTML code errors across the site as to, again, how well built the site is from a core structural foundation. Once the site's up, everything else comes down to content. You must have new content on your site on a regular basis. And I don't like to use the word consistent because that means we have to do this always at a specific time. It's less about how often we do it and making sure we do keep adding it. Because no matter how authoritative the site is to start with, like the foremost leading expert, if you disappear off the face of the earth for two years and we haven't heard from you, we have no idea if you really still are that expert. Even if you've been doing everything in the back end, there's nothing to give us any sort of proof that you are. Content on a website, keeping it with this um, natural human piece that we have in the real world, is your portfolio. If I look at a roofing company, and they're showing all the roofs they've worked on, all these pieces they've done, that's great. It does give me a sense they're capable of doing the job, and they've got plenty of experience doing the job. It still doesn't mean they can do the job. And even when I get a recommendation from a good friend, there's always this extra piece that's nagging that says, trusted source, but I want some third party validation. I want some extra testimonials. Why do we have testimonials on our websites? Okay. Online, those are your backlinks. That's what's point to the content. You can have all the content in the world about a particular topic. You can clearly be an expert. Your website can show that authority. Google can see you're likely to be the authority on this based on the amount of content, but there's still no anchor that actually states you are. And getting those backlinks pointing to your content or your site as a whole helps give Google some third-party recognition that yes, this is authoritative content. The other piece about backlinks like testimonials, where they come from matters as much as getting them in the first place. So I know everybody's gone home about getting testimonials on their website. Everybody says they work, they do. I ignore testimonials on websites. Completely. Okay. If it's a customer of yours, you are not going to put up a negative testimonial. So if all you're doing is listing positive testimonials, I've got to wonder really, are they all positive or are you just missing the negative ones? When there are testimonials on websites, one of the things I'm looking for would be Who's writing it? If you're a roofing company and you have a testimonial on your website from another roofing company, because they hired you to help out and one of their crews couldn't make to get a job done or they took on a too large a job and needed help, and they said you did an amazing job, that matters to me. I have far more faith that you can do the job because it's coming from another expert in your field, and if I look up their site, and I can see that it looks like they know what they're doing. That validates you. Okay? Google uses their backlink profile so that all of your weeks, all of your backlinks are coming from just little local businesses. It's going to have a certain value. Like a speaker being brought in from out of state is the example we always use when I speak. If I'm going to be flown in from here to New York, or New York, to specifically speak to a group on a topic, that's going to bring a huge amount of authority with it. Somebody's willing to go out of the way from me. Same thing if you're getting testimonials from others around the world as opposed to just local. Okay? That's less likely to necessarily be friends or family or other people you're related to. This is more than just directory links. You really need to get backlinks from others who carry enough credibility to give you credibility. For me, that's other people that do search engine optimization, social media. Okay. Problem we've got is how do we get those backlinks? Because in order to get backlinks, the content has to be visible to anybody who want them from, which means they have to find it in a search, which requires their backlinks, and we got a chicken for the end. That's the missing link. And a lot of people will simply take their content. Share it to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever, and call that good or work to work to figure out how to get it seen by the right people. Yep. First off, showing up in news feeds anyway is uh, good luck. 
The second piece is all the important people you probably want to reach that really can give you those valuable backlinks ain't sitting through their feed scrolling. I hit a certain point, I'm posting my stuff, I'm not bothering to look at anything else, and that's what our typical behavior is. All we do online on social media is we actually post content. We publish it here, we publish it there, we try and get the show in this feed. It's not going to do anything. I am networking. I am doing online what I used to do and still do in person. Okay? I am trying to identify anybody that could provide a valuable backlink to me. I try and stay away from the concept of influencer marketing. It just seems shady to me. And I'm not trying to use anybody to actually build me up. In my industry, I can actually look for anybody that does photography. So there's another presentation over here in the room. Um, Josh, Josh Hudson is talking about using photog stock photography and websites and the problem with it. I talk a lot about using a, use of images and creating images for websites so they actually will show properly on social media. Great time. I can easily write content and get it in front of them. That gives me great value. They've got a very old business that's got a great following and credibility. So it's not true a direct influencer. What I'm doing when I find these people is very different than what most people do on social media. No more than 30% of your time should be spent publishing new content on your pages and profiles. Period. There are times I will do no more than one post per week. I can go six months I have without posting much of anything on my Facebook page until the last month or so, and four of those are about speaking here. Now I'm even talking about my own content. I am spending the other 70% of my time networking. I have identified these brands as my brand. So if we use social Facebook as an example for this because it's easier for us to get our heads around, I am going to other business pages, Hudson Design, Warfare Plugins, if anybody is familiar with the social sharing plugin. I am actually going to their Facebook pages as tactical social media. I am liking their posts. I am taking the time to find content that they're publishing that I can actually respond to as tactical social media. And I'm doing it in such a way that I'm adding value to their conversation. The typical type of content I'll see, somebody will post, these are the top four reasons why you should be doing this. And I'll go through love one, three, and four. I would probably change two if it was me giving this list to this, and here's why. Even if that's a long comment, that does two things. It starts creating a conversation with that other brand that I now targeted. They see that I know what I'm talking about. Anybody else seeing it also sees that I'm an authority in this. And it may prompt them at that point to want to know more about who I am. They'll mouse over my brand, which will pop up a preview. And it may interest them enough to go to my page. The other way I do this is I take time to look for content. A lot of times where my content that I do publish comes from is everybody else. I spend more time sharing content sometimes than I do creating my own. And I simply add to it so it's a cross between shared content and original. And when I'm doing that and sharing that content, I'm hopefully tagging them in the page as well so that I might actually, instead of that comment, that I add a post, share their post, love this post by such and such, I would change number two to this, here's why. Bonus, I would probably add this. And I will tell you some of my Facebook posts are three and four hundred words long. Because I don't worry about things showing up in the newsfeed. The theme here is I'm trying to get everybody to go actually to my page directly. Skip the newsfeed. Take it all the way out of the equation. And the reason I make sure those tags are in there, even if I'm sharing the content, it should be notified. It's the way tags show up, especially on Facebook. And of course, when we're tagged, we want to know who tagged us and why. And that tag should drive them back to your page. 
They'll specifically end up on your post, but the theory is that they're back on your page. Here's the thing about getting to a page for the first time. How many times when you get to a business page for the first time do you only read the first post? You don't. If the business has done its job, you will read down several posts. And you will keep reading until you decide you're done and can't deal with it anymore. Okay? Good books, people tell you all the time, oh, well, no one reads a 5,000 word blog. Yeah, my mom can read a 5,000 word book in three days. If it's good, compelling content and it's written well, you'll read it. My entire content strategy when I'm publishing from my pages is strictly around getting people to move through my content. But I want you reading 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, 20 page posts deep. I know it works because I'm getting content anywhere from six months to a year old being reshared, or being commented on, or being liked. And it happens on a regular basis. I've had clients land four or five figure deals because of a six month old post. And one specific, we had posted that on July 4th of all things, two years ago, they went back and the phone was simply, please call me and post their phone. We got them to read down that far in order to see that post. I didn't care that it showed up in the newsfeed. So the piece now, in terms of the back end side of this, is if you're publishing on your website, creating blog articles, and you are sharing them along the way as part of your content strategy, that at some point, I will read down and get to it. Both of these are blog posts from my site. Two pieces here, because this comes up on a regular basis. I will never say, I just published this blog post, go read it. I will never turn around and simply say, hey, this is a great article. Go read it. Because if I come across that, I'm just blown through. If I do happen to see a news feed. I am not going on wild goose chases. It somewhat comes to me as being a bit of clickbait. Even if it's your own content. And it seems like you're certainly trying to get me to my to the website, probably to collect the email. I don't want that. I want you on my site because you want to be there. I'm summarizing my content in the body of these posts. My hope is to compel you enough that you want to click that link and follow through. And if you are trying to reach somebody at influencer levels, somebody that can really help you, I guarantee you they are not going to click through if you just tell them to do so. Read this, they might. And the hope is, now that I've got them on this WordPress site, that they may nose around and read something else I've written. And at that point, as they're creating content, and they now figure out that I am an authority figure, based on everything I've put out there, or it's related to what they're doing, there's a chance they may link back. Warfare plugins. After all, after this is again long time, long term investment. This is almost three years back and forth with the principals behind this and their team. This is what they published on their website that's linked back to me. And not only do I get the backlink value because they have a highly authoritative site. This blog post alone has 400 plus shares. They've got blog posts that have 2,000 plus shares. It is a well-read site, but this also gives me an extra bonus. I get referral traffic from this directly to my website. It's a two for one here. That's one big piece. On top of it, they added this with a click to tweet, which also points back to my social profiles. This is me taking the time using social media to network with other brands that can help me, and I'm doing so in such a way that actually helps them. This helped them create content without them having to go all the work. It means other people are saying the same things that they're saying. Even if they were at a higher authority level than I am, this is still beneficial to them. But it goes more than just the backlinks you gain from this. Bridget. Guest blogging opportunities. 
Bridget's is not the only website that I've been asked to guest blog on. There are quite a few of them. And this gives me the ability now to publish content elsewhere that potentially links back to me. And at the same time, if you're doing this and getting some recognition, this is a syndicated blog. This is a article that I wrote that was syndicated on business.twitter.com. Twitter's own website now links back to me. This is three years plus of doing this. But this has done amazing things for my search capability. Right? And as one of the interesting pieces about how I'm using social media, I have never said at any point in the thing that I'm looking for my customer or my client. I am not using, I am using social media on that level, but it's not my primary goal. I'm building relationships, yes, with them, but predominantly with others in my industry. Because when my clients who are likely to find me aren't going to find me on social media, they're going to find me in a Google search. I want to make sure I show up in the search by leveraging relationships with my influencers or others that I can support over what I do, so that when I do show up in the search, when they, my client searches, they do find me. Bottom line, if you want to rank, your sites have to be authoritative. That means a solid content marketing strategy. It means an effective social media marketing strategy. And it means having a properly built website to start with. And if you don't have a goal, don't necessarily care what else you're going to do. You're going to have a hard time ranking. The proof in all this is I don't know how many people are aware of Moz's domain authority scores. So basically, a website has Zero authority based on their algorithm for a brand new domain that is and no history on a website. And as you publish content, as you run backlinks, as their profile builds, that domain authority increases. And it exponentially gets harder to increase, so it's easier to get from zero to ten, ten to twenty, and twenty to thirty. My website, when I created it, took 11 months to get to a domain authority of 19 and 13 months to get to 23 with a page authority of 33 for the home page. I was able to do in 12 months of content and social media what some SEO firms can take six years to do within their own sites. And all this is driven by getting people from my website or to my website through social media. Question? Oh, no. <laughs> what was that? What was the name of it? SEO Moz? If you go to, yeah, well, it's SEO Moz, but Moz.com, and they have an SEO tool that you can use. Um, hi. Um, what advice or strategies do you have around um, SEO titling or SEO, like, um, SEO friendly title and So, I pay some attention to it. Um, a lot of times when you put all the stuff in Moz and it's like, you know, where you go to Yoast or CoSchedule, which is a publishing scheduling platform for social media, it does have a headline analyzer. Um, they'll say this is what would be the best title. I'll sometimes ignore it completely because this is what I want to title it. So one of the rules I have as far as search, and, search engine optimization comes down to, if I don't necessarily worry about playing by again all those rules. If it works out and it fits and it's great, perfect. If it's going to take me too long to try and optimize to get the title or to get something else, I just try the only rule I have is really make sure that whatever that meta description is matches what the content on my page is. So if it does show in the search, they're going to actually want to get to the page there. Um, so the page authority and domain authority that you threw out for your site, um, are there, when I use Moz, I look at it, you know, we're running a site and I sort of look at whatever number they have and we start off and I'm kind of looking at it going, you know, let's say the number's 25 or 33 or whatever. I don't know if that's like considered really good or bad and, and is it by industry, like, or is it by size site? Because I mean, I know like Twitter or whatever is going to have like, you know, 80 or 100 or whatever. So how do you figure... How do, you, how do you gauge what that, that number is, if it's good or not, for that site when you start? Or is it just about moving the needle for you? 
So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was good or bad because I wanted to be able to say, well, that's for a small business. Most of them are 15 out of 19, which would have been even better. Um, I think the number was something like 30 to 40 was ideal where you want to be for a small business. Most of what I'm seeing out there is in that 20 to 30 range. So on one level, it's simply just a, a guide to help you move forward. So for me, it's about moving that needle forward more than it's worried about a specific number. It just gave me a benchmark initially to say that I can move a site in that short period of time this far with this. So I was able to actually verify that all the things I've been doing all along actually work and there is some hard data to show. And then you have one with that. Awesome. I was just wondering if you had some method of choosing influencers to network network with online if there was, do you, do you actually look up their domain authority or do you just you look at how many followers that they have or do you have some sort of strategy around that? So where a lot of this came from, um, 92, 90 plus percent of the industry of social media is here. I'm over here. So I basically spent time just searching for how people are on Facebook. You can use Facebook the same way you search Google. I mean, just put up in the bar and I would be looking up for, you know, how to post on Facebook and I would just see who out there, what they're saying. And every once in a while you find somebody that's like, oh yes, I agree with you completely, so I'll go do more research about that. We have the same viewpoints. So an opening remarks that I mentioned when I met Bridget in 2009, one of the reasons why I ended up connecting with Bridget, she was one of the few people then that was teaching or talking about using social media to build relationships, which is exactly what my whole mindset was for the last two years. Everybody else is talking about how to post content and do. So it just naturally fit the follower. So I'm doing the same thing. And every once in a while, again, I didn't purposely go after looking for people. Now I do a little more. I talk about, again, photography and how to use images so they actually show up properly, how to format them properly, and image sizes. Josh, again, Hudson Design, is a perfect person I, will, I follow at this point after meeting him because we're talking the same language. And there's a way for me to support him as much as for him to support me. So it's pure symbiotic. So again, I'm just looking for people that I can connect with, that I can work with, that there's some correlation between our businesses so there's relevance. So that again, when you're looking at backlinks, if I get a backlink from a roofing company, what do they know about social media, right? So you give Google's gotta wonder if there's no relevance to, to see why these two would be linked. It starts looking black hat to them, maybe if it isn't. But photography, graphic design, there is a connection. So that's kind of the other piece of it. All right, so uh, this is about like, the, the, the networking aspect. You can, you can put in all the legwork to, to you know, find these influencers and, and write a guest post on their sites. But they can negate all that effort if they like tag your your link as being a no follow. So do you? I'm wondering, do you? you know, do you some? Do you sign some sort of contract to make them say that they're not going to do that to to so that they just so that the engine will still continue to follow those links and find your site? Or is there? You know, how do you prevent that? You don't. And again, that's the thought of I'm not worried about whether I do actually get that link or not. So one of the few SEO practices when you're hiring somebody to do SEO that I really recommend, especially if you're a larger brand and you've probably got a lot of mentions, is looking for lost backlinks where you've been mentioned on the web somewhere, but there's no link to you. Okay. Um, outside of that, I don't always pay attention. If I get a link, even if, this, even if those links from Dustin are no follow -up, He's still promoting his stuff on social media. That means there's still an opportunity for my brand to be found, to build some brand recognition for me. Because again, human behavior, if we do show up in a search later, we're more likely to click on what we're familiar with. In which case, I'm probably going to be quick before somebody else because they've seen the name over and over again and they've seen it from other influencers or others in the industry. Um, the rest of that, even if it's a no following, that's still a potential referral from, that, from their site to mine. So I'm not just gaining that search piece, I'm getting traffic from their website directly. And if any of their readers are going through that and finding it, and it could be another 
industry influencer, it's possible they print something without me having done the legwork. So my primary concern is simply building a relationship in such a way that helps them, shows my expertise and authority, gives me content to share. Most of the content I find comes from actually going and looking at everybody else's. Either I have something to share or it gives me an idea of what I'm posting. So I never have this, what am I posting today? I don't care. And then it just shows up. So, assuming you've gone through, you know, posting content, uh, going onto their business page, liking their content, commenting, and so on, um, and they're not necessarily responding. Let's say it's a bigger organization. It's you know, whatever slow to move. How do you? I mean, at some point you have to take that conversation offline, right? Or, or reach out directly to them. So, what sort of strategies do you use at that point to kind of go ahead, or do you even bother? So sometimes, again, I'm doing this to put my authority out. So one of the things we get into is that when we're talking about content, we're always looking at, I need to publish new content, I need to put new content on my pages. Comments are a form of content. In and of themselves, they are still published content. You're simply publishing in somebody else's space. It still means it's highly visible, so it still has that value to bring authority to me for anybody who sees it. So if they're a large enough brand anyway, that has a big following and people are seeing their content are likely, I'm going to still do it because I still get something out of it. Okay? At least I'm recognized. Um, the other piece that I've done back, depending on who they are, and it took a long time to get through to work our plugins, I started looking at other stuff they were posting. I didn't go to their website. I didn't look at who was writing their content. I did start looking for them on social media. And I started interacting with them personally. And because my page, my personal profile is set up, with a link to my business page. If I pique their interest, especially if you're in Facebook groups because brands can't act there, they come back and see who I am, they look at my page, they make the connection between me and my brand. And that gets into my page. So there are a couple tactics, and again, I'm not 100% always doing this with the purpose of gaining backlinks. It's to build relationship pieces. I just know long term if I do this, and again, because I'm doing this with 10 and 15 and 20 different influencers over the course of a couple weeks, one or two of here there will hit over time. And it's just, again, it's just building all this. And social media is not like most people worry about, well, how much money am I getting for what I'm spending? It's, like, it's not an expense, it's an investment. Anybody else? Hey, girl, look. It sounds like you said uh, that you didn't tell people to go and read a blog or some new comment and, and your example around Facebook was very creative but what happens if you post some fresh content you know put out something on your blog you don't tweet a link to it you how do people find it are people aware of it who don't currently follow you so one of the pieces is actually to put it out on social media so that I won't I've always been it's creative method I'm using it's how I'm creating that content and putting it out there it goes out on Twitter. I actually have micro blogs where I'll actually summarize my blog post and have three, four hundred Instagram posts. Word Instagram posts. Where I'll take the same image that I'm using that'll show up on Facebook and I'm using that on Instagram and the whole article is basically there or summarize. So I'm still pushing it out there. I'm just not telling them that, hey, I just published something, go read it. I'm giving them everything they need to know. So you still have to market, but for some of the smaller posts that I'm not sure I really want to really push hard, I'm still playing with them a little bit, and I'm still working through some of my ideas, and I don't publish them, I'm still working on other posts around them to bring traffic back, and then we'll usually have the blog post only if you have a previous post, next post kind of thing, or suggested posts. So there's still other ways that if I get them to my site overall, there's still a chance that content will be seen. You mentioned earlier that um, that you uh, on Facebook is sometimes the same content that's on your website and the blog. Do you uh, push that out automatically with some uh, plugin, or you individually go to each uh, Facebook and Twitter? Uh, however, you can push it out and do that individually. Ninety percent of all my social media content across five platforms is done in real time. And it's the same thing. And I'm managing five and six and seven different clients. Ninety percent of it is done in real time. 
I schedule very late. And there are a couple of reasons for doing so. There are specific pieces where my core content is updated and added and create a CSV file that I use Hootsuite to upload for Twitter. That is generally the extent. I may schedule out one or two posts. So if I publish the blog post on a Sunday evening, I may have Facebook posts scheduled for Monday. I usually won't have more than one or two published or scheduled at any one time. What do you use to manage that? So Facebook is internal, and I am in Facebook's platform every day. I am on Twitter every day. I publish client content on LinkedIn. I have a credit either if I need to keep things a little bit tighter for my schedule. I'll actually create the entire body of that post that sits in a Gmail draft. I can pull it up from my phone if I have to, wherever I'm happy to be waiting online somewhere, and publish it at that time. The advantage for me in publishing in real time, one, I don't want, again, everything around WordCamp, and I'm the one that's the voice behind all the social media content here, that has been around aviation. Right? And a lot of tweets and a lot of signs you see. So had there been an airline disaster, every piece of content that is scheduled to be put out in that near future needs to be axed. And if I've scheduled 25 or 30 different tweets over two or three days, and I've got Facebook posts scheduled, that is a nightmare for me when I'm sitting here doing something to go back and undo. So by limiting what's out there, I can act a lot faster. It means I have fewer problems to deal with with reputation later and making a mistake. It also allows me to react to changes. Like one of my clients, we had a concept set up that we knew we were going to do. And they had a last minute thing that came out from a client of theirs, a testimonial that was huge. They created a video for them. We pushed off the other piece of content we're going to do. I didn't have to go back and unschedule, reschedule, move things around on four platforms. So it is longer. It is more work. But doing the groundwork and putting in that time yields results. If you want to automate everything, you take away the relationship piece. The other, the other, and the other piece for me really doing that, um, I'm, on the, I'm in the platforms. And if I'm using Hootsuite or CoSchedule or any other third-party program to do the majority of my posting, I'm over here. We tend to not go back and do the networking piece. But if I'm already in Facebook, it takes me five minutes to go just run a quick search or play while I'm there for a client, and then I move on to the next one. I can't just Forget it. So that 70% of what I have to do, you know, once I'm out of bed and I'm moving through the day, it's a lot easier to get all my errands done if I'm still laying in bed. So if I'm actually in Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I can actually network and do because I'm already there, not taking any effort. And I get to see the entire picture, not just this snapshot. Uh, so, so it sounds like you do this for other clients, and I am in somewhat of a, a similar position as a communication manager um, for usually full time. Uh, currently, I'm doing it for a few different people, but um, it sounds like the idea is that you need to understand enough about the business's domain to um, be able to comment intelligently on uh, influencer site on behalf of the company. Um, and in that sense, you're kind of managing the central social media account. And then there's also kind of um, the individuals in the business who also have their own social media accounts. And I imagine that I, following your um, advice, I would encourage them to go out and make similar comments. And um, so just kind of wondering, but they, at the same time, they hired you to be the one that, to do all that stuff for them so they don't have to be so, um, spend their time marketing. So I'm just wondering how you, how you deal with um, the, the tension between uh, you as the uh, social media voice and the, the, the people that are in the business. So the, that gets to the heart of something that I've played with for several years. I don't do social media management. I don't like the term social media management. I do content management. For me to work with a client, the content that is being published, they need to provide me. They are the experts. They know it better than I do. I am not going to be able to create the authority around them by creating my own content for them. I will look for content the more we're doing working together. I will see things as I'm working with other clients that may be up their alley. I will send it to them. Can we use this? Is this something you want to use? 
and I will ask them to give me more on it, and I will drag it out of them if I have to. And so if we're going to share a link, good, I need to drag out of them why we're sharing this link. What was it about me reading this article? The same way I can read an article, if that's exactly what I've been saying for three years, I would also do this and this, they need to give it to me. My job is to make sure it gets out and published properly, and to create how it's published so we're not doing all the same thing at once, and to stagger some of this. I also make sure I work especially with larger brands that I'll create an employee advocacy program for a company. And then I will sit down with their staff where it's done through online meetings where this is what we're looking to do. That we want you to go interact as yourself. We want you to share company content. We want you to interact on company contact, uh, content and anything you see that's related. Identify, comment if you can. We go through this list based on what the brand's parameters are, what they're willing to allow others to do. I will do what I call basic or limited engagement, that there are things I can certainly set. They can turn around and ask a question that I can actually answer because of the time you're working with the client. It's a learning thing for me, too. I'm learning more and more about other brands and other businesses this way. And I'm bringing my somewhat decades of experience in other brands to it. When I get to a point where something's made and I can't answer the question, I'll come in as a brand and said, we'll get our technical advisor to give us an answer and get back to you shortly. So at least there's an immediate conversation. Email or text message goes off. They get me the information. I'm replying with them. Or they say, hey, we'll just have our manager log in and provide the answer. So it's a, it's a big piece of it. What I generally can do in terms of the networking for them is I will get a list of brands that they work with or they're interested in or follow <coughs> where we can find content or interact in such a way. And when possible, I'll react to it. I'll add comments to it. If not, the link to that Facebook post, the link to that tweet or that Instagram article gets sent off in an email or gets sent off via text message or whatever messaging platform we're using. And I make sure that they know they have to do this. And one big piece for me, if you listen to me, if you do all the things I ask you to do, you get me the content that I need from you, if you turn around and when you need to interact with somebody and I tell you to do it, you do it, the results will be there. If you're going to miss stages of this, the results are going to be for less. And then it's on them to do it. So I am not completely tying what they're paying me to do based on results. It does require them to do this. You can't hand off social media, which is a relationship-based thing, to a third party. You have to be involved at least to a point on your own. Few exceptions. <laughs> there are a few exceptions. There are, but again, you also know your clients very well. Okay? You can do the social media for me because you know how I think and work. And that takes some time, some learning, and meeting. Anybody else? After party, six o'clock, Haggerty's.